Chapter 13 of Aircraft and Submarines by Willis J. Abbott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Tomko. John P. Holland and Simon Lake. Part 2. In those days, submarine boats were a much more unusual sight than they are today, and simple fishermen who had never read or heard about submarines undoubtedly experienced disturbing sensations when they ran across their first underwater boat. Mr. Lake, a short time ago, while addressing a meeting of electrical engineers in Brooklyn, told the following experience which he had on one of his trips in the Argonaut. On the first trip down the Chesapeake Bay, we had been running along in 40 feet of water and had been down about four hours. Night was coming on, so we decided to come up to find out where we were. I noticed one of those Chesapeake bug eyes lighting just to leeward of us, and as I opened the conning tower hatch, called to the men aboard to find out where we were. As soon as I did so, he turned his boat around and made straight for the beach. I thought he was rather discourteous. He ran his boat up on that beach and never stopped. The last I saw of him was when he jumped ashore and started to run inland as hard as he and his helper could go. Finally, I learned we were just above the mouth of the York or Rappahannock River, and I found a sort of inland harbor back of it. I decided to put up there for the night. Then, learning that there was a store nearby, we called after dark for more provisions, and I noticed a large crowd there. We got what we wanted and stepped outside the door. He asked us where we were from. We are down here in the submarine boat, Argonaut, making an experimental trip down the bay. He then commenced to laugh. That explains it, he said. Just before nightfall, Captain So-and-so and his mate came running up here to the store just as hard as they could and both dropped down exhausted. And when we were able to get anything out of them, they told a very strange story. That's why all these people are here. This is the story the storekeeper told me. The men were out dredging, and all at once they noticed a buoy with a red flag on it, and that buoy was going against the tide, and they could not understand it. It came up alongside, and they heard a puff, puff, something like a locomotive puffing, and then they smelled sulfur. The puff, puff was the exhaust of our engine, and those fumes were what they thought was sulfur. Just then, the thing rose up out of the water. Then the smokestack appeared, and then the devil came right out of that smokestack. In the January 1899 issue of McClure's Magazine, there appeared a profusely illustrated article entitled, Voyaging Under the Sea. The first part of it, the submarine boat Argonaut and her achievements, was written by Simon Lake himself. In it, he quotes as follows from the logbook of the Argonaut under the date of July 28, 1898. Submerged at 8.20 a.m. in about 30 feet of water. Temperature in living apartment, 83 degrees Fahrenheit. Compass bearing west-northwest, one-quarter west. Quite a lively sea running on the surface, also strong current. At 10.45 a.m., shut down engine, temperature 88 degrees Fahrenheit. After engine was shut down, we could hear the wind blowing past our pipes extending above the surface. We could also tell by the sound when any steamers were in the vicinity. We first allowed the boat to settle gradually to the bottom, with the tide running ebb. After a time, the tide changed, and she would work slightly sideways. We admitted about 400 pounds of water additional, but she still would move occasionally, so that a pendulum nine inches long would sway one-eighth of an inch Thwart ship. At 12 o'clock, noon, temperature was 87 degrees Fahrenheit. At 2.45 p.m., the temperature was still 87 degrees Fahrenheit. There were no signs of carbonic acid gas at 2.45, although the engine had been closed down for three hours and no fresh air had been admitted during the time. Could hear the whistle of boats on the surface, and also their propellers when running close to the boat. At 3.30, the temperature had dropped to 85 degrees. At 3.45, found a little sign of carbonic acid gas, very slight, however, as a candle would burn fairly bright in the pits. Thought we could detect a smell of gasoline by comparing the fresh air which came down the pipe when hand blower was turned. Storage lamps were burning during the five hours of submergence while engine was not running. At 3.50, engine was again started and went off nicely. 
went into diving compartment and open door, came out through air lock and left pressure there, found the wheels had buried about ten inches or one foot as the bottom had several inches of mud. We had 500 pounds of air in the tanks and it ran the pressure down to 250 pounds to open the door in about 30 feet. The temperature fell in the diving compartment to 82 degrees after the compressed air was let in. Cooked clam fritters and coffee for supper. The spirits of the crew appeared to improve the longer we remained below. The time was spent in catching clams, singing, trying to waltz, playing cards, and writing letters to wives and sweethearts. Our only visitors during the day were a couple of black bass that came and looked in at the windows with a great deal of apparent interest. In future boats, it will be well to provide a smoking compartment, as most of the crew had their smoking apparatus already as soon as we came up started pumps at 6.20, and arrived at the surface at 6.30. Down altogether 10 hours and 15 minutes. People on pilot boat, Calvert, thought we were all hands drowned. The second part of this article was called A Voyage on the Bottom of the Sea. It was written by Ray Stannard Baker, who had been fortunate enough to receive an invitation from Mr. Lake to accompany him on one of the trips of the Argonaut. Anyone who has read Jules Verne's fascinating story, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, must be struck immediately with the similarity between Mr. Baker's experiences and those of Captain Nemo's guests. It is not at all surprising, therefore, to have Mr. Baker tell us that during this trip, Mr. Lake told him, When I was 10 years old, I read Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and I have been working on submarine boats ever since. Mr. Baker's record of what he saw and how he felt is not only a credit to his keen powers of observation, but also a proof of the fact that, in many ways, there was little difference between the Argonaut of 1898 and the most up-to-date submarine of today. In part, he says, Simon Lake planned an excursion on the bottom of the sea for October 12, 1898 his strange amphibian craft the argonaut about which we had been hearing so many marvels lay off the pier at atlantic highlands before we were near enough to make out her hulk we saw a great black letter a framed of heavy gas pipe rising forty feet above the water a flag rippled from its summit as we drew nearer we discovered that there really wasn't any hulk to make out only a small oblong deck shouldering deep in the water and supporting a slightly higher platform from which rose what seemed to be a squatty funnel a moment later we saw that the funnel was provided with a cap somewhat resembling a tall silk hat the crown of which was represented by a brass binnacle this cap was tilted back, and as we ran alongside, a man stuck his head up over the rim and sang out, Ahoy there! A considerable sea was running, but I observed that the Argonaut was planted as firmly in the water as a stone pillar, the big waves splitting over her without imparting any perceptible motion. We scrambled up on the little platform and peered down through the open conning tower, which we had taken for a funnel, into the depths of the ship below. Wilson had started his gasoline engine. Mr. Lake had taken his place at the wheel, and we were going ahead slowly, steering straight across the bay toward Sandy Hook and deeper water. The Argonaut makes about five knots an hour on the surface, but when she gets deep down on the sea bottom, where she belongs, she can spin along more rapidly. The Argonaut was slowly sinking under the water. We became momentarily more impressed with the extreme smallness of the craft to which we were trusting our lives. The little platform around the conning tower on which we stood, in reality the top of the gasoline tank, was scarcely a half dozen feet across, and the Argonaut herself was only thirty-six feet long. Her sides had already faded out of sight, but not before we had seen how solidly they were built, all of steel, riveted and reinforced, so that the wonder grew how such a tremendous weight, when submerged, could ever again be raised. I think we made some inquiries about the safety of submarine boats in general. Other water compartments had been flooded, and we had settled so far down that the waves dashed repeatedly over the platform on which we stood, and the conning tower was still wide open, inviting a sudden engulfing rush of water. You mustn't confuse the Argonaut with ordinary submarine boats, said Mr. Lake. She is quite different and much safer. He explained that the Argonaut was not only a submarine boat, but much besides. 
She not only swims either on the surface or beneath it, but she adds to this accomplishment the extraordinary power of diving deep and rolling along the bottom of the sea on wheels. No machine ever before did that. Indeed, the Argonaut is more properly a sea motorcycle than a boat. In its invention, Mr. Lake elaborated an idea which the United States Patent Office has decided to be absolutely original. We found ourselves in a long, narrow compartment, dimly illuminated by yellowish-green light from the little round glass windows. The stern was filled with Wilson's gasoline engine and the electric motor, and in front of us, toward the bow, we could see through the heavy steel doorways of the diver's compartment into the lookout room, where there was a single round eye of light. I climbed up the ladder of the conning tower and looked out through one of the glass ports. My eyes were just even with the surface of the water. A wave came driving and foaming entirely over the top of the vessel, and I could see the curiously beautiful sheen of the bright summit of the water above us. It was a most impressive sight. Mr. Lake told me that in very clear water it was difficult to tell just where the air left off and the water began. But in the muddy bay where we were going down, the surface looked like a peculiarly clear, greenish pane of glass moving straight up and down, not forward, as the waves appear to move when looked at from above. Now we were entirely under water. The rippling noises that the waves had made in beating against the upper structure of the boat had ceased. As I looked through the thick glass port, the water was only three inches from my eyes, and I could see thousands of dainty, semi-translucent jellyfish floating about as lightly as thistle-down. They gathered in the eddy behind the conning tower in great numbers, bumping up sociably against one another and darting up and down with each gentle movement of the water, and I realized that we were in the domain of the fishes. Jim brought the government chart and Mr. Lake announced that we were heading directly for Sandy Hook and the open ocean. But we had not yet reached the bottom, and John was busily opening valves and letting in more water. I went forward to the little steel cuddy hole in the extreme prow of the boat and looked out through the watch port. The water had grown denser and yellower, and I could not see much beyond the dim outlines of the ship's spar reaching out forward. Jim said that he had often seen fishes come swimming up wonderingly to gaze into the port. They would remain quite motionless until he stirred his head, and then they vanished instantly. Mr. Lake has a remarkable photograph which he took of a visiting fish, and Wilson tells of nurturing a queer flat crab for days in the crevice of one of the view holes. At that moment I felt a faint jolt, and Mr. Lake said that we were on the bottom of the sea. Here we were running as comfortably along the bottom of Sandy Hook Bay as we would ride in a Broadway car, and with quite as much safety. Wilson, who was of a musical turn, was whistling Down Went McGinty, and Mr. Lake, with his hands on the pilot wheel, put in an occasional word about his marvelous invention. On the wall opposite, there was a row of dials which told automatically every fact about our condition that the most nervous of men could wish to know. One of them shows the pressure of air in the main compartment of the boat. Another registers vacuum, and when both are at zero, Mr. Lake knows that the pressure of the air is normal, the same as it is on the surface, and he tries to maintain it in this condition. There are also a cyclometer, not unlike those used on bicycles, to show how far the boat travels on the wheels. A depth gauge, which keeps us accurately informed as to the depth of the boat in the water, and a declension indicator. By the long finger of the declension dial, we could tell whether we were going uphill or down. Once, while we were out, there was a sudden sharp shock. The pointer leaped back and then quivered steady again. Mr. Lake said that we had probably struck a bit of wreckage or an embankment, but the Argonaut was running so lightly that she had leaped up jauntily and slid over the obstruction. We had been keeping our eyes on the depth dial, the most fascinating and interesting of any of the number. It showed that we were going down, 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 literally down to the sea in a ship. When we had been submerged for more than an hour, and there was thirty feet of yellowish-green ocean over our heads, Mr. Lake suddenly ordered the machinery stopped. The clacking noises of the dynamo ceased, and the electric lights blinked out leaving us at once in almost absolute darkness and silence. 
Before this, we had found it hard to realize that we were on the bottom of the ocean. Now it came upon us suddenly, and not without a touch of awe. This absence of sound and light, this unchanging motionlessness and coolness, this absolute negation, that was the bottom of the sea. It lasted only a moment, but in that moment we realized acutely the meaning and joy of sunshine and moving winds, trees, and the world of men. A minute light twinkled out like a star, and then another, and another, until the boat was bright again and we knew that among the other wonders of this most astonishing of inventions there was storage electricity which would keep the boat illuminated for hours without so much as a single turn of the dynamo with the stopping of the engine the air supply from above had ceased but mr lake laid his hand on the wheel wall above us where he said there was enough air compressed to last us all for two days should anything happen the possibility of something happening had been lurking in our minds ever since we started what if your engine should break down so that you couldn't pump the water out of the water compartments i asked here we have hand pumps said mr lake promptly and if those failed a single touch of this lever would release our iron keel which weighs four thousand pounds and up we would go like a rocket i questioned further only to find that every imaginable contingency and some that were not at all imaginable to the uninitiated had been absolutely provided against by the genius of the inventor and everything from the gasoline engine to the hand pump was as compact and ingenious as the mechanism of a watch moreover the boat was not crowded we had plenty of room to move around and to sleep if we wished to say nothing of eating as for eating, John had brought out the kerosene stove and was making coffee while Jim cut the pumpkin pie. This isn't Delmonico's, said Jim, but we're serving a lunch that Delmonico's couldn't serve, a submarine lunch. By this time, the novelty was wearing off, and we sat there at the bottom of the sea drinking our coffee with as much unconcern as though we were in an uptown restaurant. For the first time since we started, Mr. Lake sat down and we had an opportunity of talking with him at leisure. He is a stout-shouldered, powerfully built man in the prime of life, a man of cool common sense, a practical man who is also an inventor. And he talks frankly and convincingly, and yet modestly, of his accomplishment. Having finished our lunch, Mr. Lake prepared to show us something about the practical operations of the Argonaut it has been a good deal of a mystery to us how workmen penned up in a submarine boat could expect to recover gold from wrecks in the water outside or to place torpedoes or to pick up cables we simply open the door and the diver steps out on the bottom of the sea mr lake said quite as if he was conveying the most ordinary information at first it seemed incredible but mr lake showed us the heavy riveted door in the bottom of the diver's compartment then he invited us inside with wilson who besides being an engineer is also an expert diver the massive steel doors of the little room were closed and barred and then mr lake turned a cock and the air rushed in under high pressure at once our ears began to throb and it seemed as if the drums would burst inward keep swallowing said wilson the diver as soon as we applied this remedy the pain was relieved but the general sensation of increased air pressure, while exhilarating, was still most uncomfortable. The finger on the pressure dial kept creeping up and up, until it showed that the air pressure inside of the compartment was nearly equal to the water pressure without. Then Wilson opened a cock in the door. Instantly the water gushed in, and for a single instant we expected to be drowned there like rats in a trap this is really very simple mr lake was saying calmly when the pressure within is the same as that without no water can enter with that wilson dropped the iron door and there was the water and the muddy bottom of the sea within touch of a man's hand it was all easy enough to understand and yet it seemed impossible even as we saw it with our own eyes mr lake stooped down and picked up a wooden rod having a sharp hook at the end this he pulled along the bottom we were now rising again to the surface after being submerged for more than three hours i climbed into the conning tower and watched for the first glimpse of the sunlight there was a sudden fluff of foam the ragged edge of a wave 
and then I saw, not more than a hundred feet away, a smack bound toward New York under full sail. Her rigging was full of men, gazing curiously in our direction, no doubt wondering what strange monster of the sea was coming forth for a breath of air. End of John P. Holland and Simon Lake, Part 2 Recording by William Tomko